You know, sometimes it can... Sometimes it looks vague. <laughs> For you as a lawyer and someone who also uh, teach, uh, you teach law, what would mean sub substantial compliance for you in an argument such as that? Well, the court have interpreted substantial non-compliance to mean that that non-compliance must be established by cogent and compelling evidence. Take, for example, the case in Ebony State. The, the alleged overvoting, they did not tender a register of voters to show that the result of the INEC was substantially different from the result that they believe was actually uh, the, the actual result in that uh, petition. They raised issue of uh, criminality. Now, when you raise criminality, you're bringing in criminal element to it. You have to establish beyond reasonable doubt. You do not do that by making a statement or throwing a document at the court. You have to link the content of the document to the maker and then link it all together to the petition, then convince the court by coaching and compelling argument that that evidence or testimony tendered in court is credible to affect the outcome of your petition. Do you agree with those who said that uh, there was conflict? I mean, where there was conflict between the Electoral Act and the Constitution, that the Tribunal and the Appeal Court followed the Electoral Act, and then the Supreme Court, with this judgment, seemed to have brought about uh, some sort of certainty by following the Constitution? Right. L let, me, let me say this, that we have not seen the reason uh, of the judgment of the court. The court has reserved a date, I think April, uh, February 12th, yeah. to yeah. give the reason. The reason, this racial dissidenti, is much more important sometimes than even the judgment itself, because that is the, 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 the reason at which the court arrived at our decision. Now, it is elementary that where any law is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution, then that law, to the extent of the inconsistency, is null and void. Now, any court of law that, that ruled, a, a, you know, ruled a matter or decision in favor of the Electoral Act, or even the guidelines of INEC over and above the Constitution, I mean, it is elementary to know that that law uh, cannot stand in the light of the supremacy of the Constitution over any law, any authority, and any institution in the country. Now, you've just said that you know, the reasons are yet to be out, and so it, it's a bit difficult to say if this has any implications. But from what you have deduced happened in the court, do you think it has implication for how elections will be conducted in future? Yeah, I, I believe so, except that I have a concern. Now, if you look at Shinkafi and Yaring, the decision of the Supreme Court delivered about two or three weeks ago, where they touched the issue of the card reader. We can safely at this point assume that the card reader has done us no good. In the sense that the idea behind the introduction of the card reader, if you look at paragraphs 22 and 28 of the guidelines of INEG, it was to come to the point where that could only be the ground on which votes are going to be authenticated. However, the courts throughout the country, only a few of them recognized card reader, but majority of the courts ignored the provision of the card reader. So as it stands, the electoral art provision for the register of voters is superior and over whatever result that the card reader brings. That is one aspect. And the one way by which we would also know, even though the Supreme Court has not given her, judge, her detailed judgment, one way by which we can, you know, arrive at a logical and intelligent conclusion is to look at what did the Supreme Court do. If the Supreme Court overruled the decision of the trial tribunal and court of appeal, then what it means is that the argument canvas for which the tribunal or court of appeal arrived at that decision is not the law. Then the other way is to look at the petitioners and the appellant. What did they argue before the court? which the trial tribunal and the court of appeal refused to grant. Since the Supreme Court overruled the decision of the trial tribunal and the court of appeal, then it is safe to assume that the argument of the appellant seemed to be the aspect of law that the Supreme Court is tilting towards. And so we can conclude that the Supreme Court's mind is that because the petitioner could not prove substantially his uh, petition at the tribunal, he couldn't have gotten that judgment that was granted to him by the tribunal. You know, I, I asked the, the, the question about substantial compliance and non-compliance, uh, even though, as we all agree, and we all know that we have to wait till February 12th, you, you, the counsel to Governor Weekes did say that out of uh, some of the evidence pr 
presented uh, at the tribunal that is before they got to the Supreme Court, uh, about 23, uh, just only 11 was uh, looked into. Tell us the, the, the dynamics of moving to the Supreme Court for those who feel aggrieved when they get to that point where they feel that justice has not been served. Uh, what should be those things as a counsel that you look out for that will make you say, I think we have a good case uh, at the Supreme Court? Uh, you, you, first of all, you look at the ground on which you're bringing your petition. Section 138, so 1, A, B, C, and D provides for the grounds on which election will be challenged. Surprising enough and funny, I have seen in 2015 petitions bringing, you're bringing a petition on all the four grounds. You're asking the court to disqualify the person, which the effect will be to conduct election. You're asking the court to also rule that you score the, the other subsection C, 1C, which is that the person, the winner did not get the highest uh, lawful vote. You're asking the court for which the effect is to give you the decision. So your prayers by their very nature are inconsistent with each other. How can you get the blessing of the court? This is one. Two, the level and the, uh, our justice system in Nigeria is that we have the trial court, we have the court of appeal, and the Supreme Court. So if you feel that you have canvassed your argument and you didn't get that judgment at the trial level, there is the Court of Appeal for you to take that argument over. And then if at the Court of Appeal you fail to also establish that, then on appeal to the Supreme Court, you get the opportunity to have the Supreme Court X-ray the decision of the Court of Appeal and arrive at that decision. So somewhere between the tribunal to the Supreme Court, there must be a justice to the case. The unfortunate thing is actually with the, 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 the way our politicians react to judgment that make us think as if the judiciary is bad in the way we paint them black. But the judge can give a decision honestly believing he's right and the appellate court will rule him wrong. It doesn't mean he collected a bribe. And if a judge collects a bribe, that is a means by which you can seek a redress against the conduct of that judge. But I believe and I have confidence in the judicial system in Nigeria. Look at it for example. At the Supreme Court, APC won their cases, PDP won their cases. So if the, if the judiciary favors a particular party, why is it that at the Supreme Court, uh, Wiki won over and against uh, uh, the Akuku Peter side? And we all know that River State is the bastion of PDP as far as the South South is concerned. Why is it that Ibikule Amosun won over the other fellow and he is from APC? And we know that PDP has a history of being strong in, in, in Ogun State. Why is it that in Boeing, PDP won and Labour Party could not establish their case? Why is it that in Yari's case, uh, APC won? So even when you're going to the Supreme Court now from the Court of Appeal, you should be able to know if, for example, you're asking the court to disqualify someone and you are not a member of that political party, and what you're asking for the court to disqualify are considered as party affairs, you know even before going to the Supreme Court that you have a weak case because the Supreme Court has held nomination and sponsorship of a candidate is the business of the political party and the person with a local standard is the member of that political party who vied in the primaries and not a member of another political party. So you even know before going to the airport that your flight has taken off, you, you, you've missed your flight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's an interesting perspective. But let's get back to this one and look at what you mentioned about the card reader. You use the word, hasn't done us any good, as the courts have found. That's a fear of many. Because if, uh, I mean, politicians today say, well, I haven't seen the Supreme Court cases where they think the card readers hasn't done us any good. Not forgetting the intention of introduction of the card reader was to ensure that one man gets to vote once. And you don't go about rigging elections. So, Aren't we going to be, or shouldn't we be bothered that if the card reader hasn't done us any good, as you referred, I mean, by, as you referred to only recently, that if they eventually scrap the card readers, wouldn't we be back to square one? <laughs> I, I believe so. But then I also want to give the benefit of doubt to the decision of the Supreme Court because, uh, Chamberlain, you and I know that in 2015, the card reader did not work in many places in the country. You remember the former president, Jonathan, how many times the card reader rejected him. Can you imagine a card reader rejecting a president? So if, for example, the card reader had worked, 
to a 60 to 70 percent level, I am convinced the Supreme Court would have nailed the card reader as the law in the country. But the Supreme Court is also aware that the card reader did not work in most part of the country. So the justice of the case would be to overlook the card reader at the moment so that the National Assembly would do something about it or before the next election, INEC will be able to do uh, something cogent and we get the card reader going. Card reader is important, but it hasn't worked you know, by the various decisions of the court in 2015. Uh -huh. I will give you an example. Yeah, of the decision ahead. of the Supreme Court also that has thrown fear and despair to the land. The issue related in Administration of Criminal Justice Act, it was is clearly stated that stay of proceedings will not be granted. Mm -hmm. But we have all seen in, in the case of Saraki how the Supreme Court honored that application for a stay of proceedings in the face of an obvious provision of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. And the effect of it is that the issue of stay of proceedings has been destroyed. And that means technicality has come back to the sitting room and then technicality in criminal matter will also stall proceedings. But you know, the judgment of the Supreme Court is final, not because the Supreme Court is infallible, but, but the Supreme Court is infallible because it is a final court. But then there is also a check on the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court gives a judgment that we consider has not helped the polity, the National Assembly has the opportunity of passing a law that will set aside that decision of the Supreme Court in the future event and correct the anomalies. And they've done that, you know, over time when you look at Amitri and Nainik and a host of other decisions of the Supreme Court. You know, and, and this is part of the reason why we keep saying that, look, Nainik should publish the report as to what went down, how did people vote in the last general election so that people can analyze it with what they saw in the field for those who were there. And then we move forward about this. But then, still speaking about the card reader, Edo elections will be coming up soon. Uh, and then with the kinds of judgments we've seen about the card readers, how do you think we should approach this? Except if, if, if in the future, I would, as, I would say that let us get, because some of the argument that uh, were conversed this year against the, pro, uh, the provision of the card reader and its effect in law. Lagos said he does not have the life of his own. Eboni said mm -hmm. he does not have the force of law because the guideline of INEC is considered inferior to the provision of the electoral act that recognizes the register of voters. So if the National Assembly will pass a law, bring this provision of the guidelines of INEC into the electoral act, that means you are placing it at par with other provisions of the, uh, the electoral act regarding register of voters. And we know in law, when you are giving a judgment, the law that comes later seeks a sort of, uh, you know, express the intention of the lawmakers.